Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. As your senator from New York, I supported a greater emphasis on community policing, along with putting more officers on the street to get to know those communities. David Dinkins was an early pioneer of this policy. His leadership <laughs> helped lay the foundation for dramatic drops in crime in the years that followed. Uh, I don't know whether to talk about the liar uh, who wants to be president, who wears a skirt. David Dinkins brought about a drop in crime. Is there any, a New Yorker listening to this show who wants to see the Dinkins days returning with squeegee men dirtying your windshield and crimes of every nature on the streets? Are you kidding me? How does she get away with an answer because no one stops her? But yesterday I walked a line, and uh, there's a great song, I Walked a Line, by a f American folk singer. Who, who did it for I Walked a Line? Yeah, play Johnny Cash, I Walked a Line. Because yesterday I walked a line, I was on a thousand foot tightrope, a thousand feet in the air, discussing gay marriage. I did the best show of my life, <clears throat> in my estimation. <clears throat> but it took a lot out of me because no matter what you say on the issue of gay marriage, you're going to be attacked. You'll be attacked uh, uh, by both sides. I walked the line already. Thank you. Now we can end it. The, the timing is everything in radio. The refrain I could have done without, the walk the line I could have used. But all right, that's better than nothing. There's a lot of stories that are rattling around inside my brain. Gay marriage is one. We have new sound again on it. I may as well begin with the new sound on that because I then want to talk about Soros's coming tax bill and Apple may have to pay Ireland 10 years of back taxes. Oh, yeah. You didn't know that, huh? Mr. George Soros, who put Barry Obama in office, has been deferring taxes for many years by using every scheme known to mankind while telling you to pay your fair share. Does it sound familiar to you? George, uh, Warren Buffett, another one, another great American. He gets all sorts of deals from Obama, including shooting down the uh, Keystone XL pipeline because his trains run the oil from the Alberta tar sands to our refinery. So what does he want? Uh, a pipe that could do it for 100 times cheaper. Then he tells you to pay more taxes. And then, of course, there's Apple, another wonderful company that everyone loves so much. Headline, Apple may have to pay Ireland 10 years of back taxes. Want to hear what they've been paying in taxes? Get ready for this, all you good liberals. Apple has paid as little as 2% on profits attributed to its subsidiaries in Ireland, well below the 35% top rate in the United States, and even well below Ireland's 12.5% rate. Don't you love that? Wait, it gets even better. It gets even better. Disney is firing IT workers like the plague and hiring people from India at one half the price. Disney now. And the Department of Homeland Security says nothing. Why do you think all of these rats were screaming for, the, for, for immigration, including that one in the undershirt? The brat with the undershirt who got lucky from Harvard, whatever his name is. Faiselberg. Mark uh, Faiselberg. Remember Mark Faiselberg was a big mouth for illegal immigration, making them all legal? Do you think he goes to dinner with illegal immigrants? Do you think he washes the feet of illegal aliens from Tijuana like Nancy Pelosi does? He wanted B-1B visas to lower his costs. He wanted immigrants simply to shaft American workers, Mark Faiselberg. You think because these guys are worth $100 billion that they're happy? They'd cut your heart out for another dollars in pro dollar in profit. Yeah. So you see riots the other day in Baltimore. The morons, what are they rioting? They don't even know who Freddie Gray is. Rioting. And what they steal? Toilet paper. Did you see how many pictures of the, of the, uh, the lowlifes? You're not allowed to call them uh, thugs. I'll call them subhumans. If you don't like the word thug, maybe that'll apply better. Because once you go below the level of humanity and you're not civil, you're, you're a subhuman. 
They break into a store. The city's burning. What does he rob? A, a jar of mouthwash and toilet paper. My dog's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm not making this up, Teddy. Human beings are insane. They burn a city to the ground to rob toilet paper out of CVS with a jug of mouthwash. And the store is burned to the ground. Then they'll complain that Whitey didn't rebuild the city fast enough for them. A minority city, they'll say that the whites caused them to burn the city to the ground. And they want more money to rebuild it so they can burn it to the ground again. It's a crazy world out there. Now, now, couple the guy robbing toilet paper after the Baltimore riots. Toilet paper, I swear to you. Uh, well, okay, it was eight rolls of paper. You could see it was worth burning a building to the ground for that. It wasn't just one one roll of toilet paper that the uh, the uh, wonderful citizen of Baltimore stole off CVS as it burnt. It was eight to 12. It was a 12-pack, along with mouthwash. On one side, you have the idiot robbing toilet paper after burning a city down. Doesn't work for a living. Lives on welfare, probably deals drugs on the side. And here's another story. Sales of $100 million homes rise to record worldwide. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I've never seen anything like the disparity. So you say, what's the answer to take the rich and eat the rich and give the money to the guy who robs toilet paper? No, the answer is to make the guy who robs toilet paper clean the gutter. That's the answer. Put them to work in public service jobs, cleaning their city, rebuilding their city. That's what you do. So let's go back to gay weddings. That's all anyone wants to talk about. That's what you want to talk about. Nothing else. It's a good topic. I did it yesterday. I'll do it again today. We'll revisit it. 855-407-282. Let us begin with the actual voices involved with Antonin Scalia. The man robbing toilet paper would not have known who he is. He would have think he was some Italian who ran Baltimore in the 50s. But no, Antonin Scalia is on the U.S. Supreme Court. And he's arguing with a woman named... Bonato. It's Italian versus Italian. Antonin Scully is the conservative. Ms. Bonato is the gay arguer, the arguer for the gay marriages. So Scalia asked Bonato the following. Let's hear clip one. Do you agree that, uh, that, that uh, ministers will not have to conduct same-sex marriages? That's, if they do not want to, that is correct. I believe that is firm under the First Amendment. She believes. Notice she's a snake like all lawyers. I believe it's part of the First Amendment. Well, listen, Ms. Bonato, if it's part of the First Amendment, then why are your cohorts harassing pizza shop owners and bakeries to make cakes for gays when they don't want to? Isn't that part of their First Amendment, Ms. Bonato? You're clean and nice in front of the Supreme Court now. You're wearing a nice press skirt, and you're a Miss Curtsy and Miss, Miss This. Yeah, First Amendment. You know you don't believe in the First Amendment. You believe in the Gay Amendment which is do it our way or go to the highway. Don't tell us you believe in the First Amendment. Then Scalia goes on about clergy in clip two. Listen to this. But ministers who, who do not believe in, in same-sex marriage will still be authorized to conduct marriages on behalf of the state. You can't do that once it is a constitutional prescription. No answer to that. Right, of course. Once it's a constitutional prescription, then the ministers can't perform any marriage unless they perform gay marriages as well as straight marriages. I guess you can't say straight marriage anymore. That's sort of a slur. Uh, you have to use same sex. I, I never heard of it. It's like, if I, if I, my, both my parents deceased a long time ago. If I said to them, you know that you, you were an opposite sex couple, they would have looked at me like, like I was crazy. Who ever heard of a redefinition of this in your lifetime? Your mother and father were an opposite sex couple. You hear this? They had to redefine themselves for less than 1% of the population. Oh, yeah, yeah. Your grandmother, grandfather, going back a million years, they were, they were opposite-sex couples, let's say 5,000 years. So then Varelli, whoever he is, I guess he's another one arguing for uh, the other side. We, I mean, I have to be fair to the subject. Let's hear clip three now. The opportunity to marry is integral to human dignity. Excluding gay and lesbian couples from marriage demeans the dignity of these couples. It demeans their children, and it denies the, the, both the couples and their children the stabilizing structure that marriage affords. All of a sudden, marriage. I knew gay people. None of them ever wanted to be married. It's the furthest thing from their mind. The last thing the gay people I knew wanted was marriage. They entered that lifestyle to get away from the conventional life that their parents had because they, they couldn't stand it. It was stifling them. I know things were different then. I get it. It's different now. I get it. I understand that. It's a different time. 
Now suddenly marriage is the most important thing in the world to the gay community. Are you kidding me? Do you really think this is about marriage? We discussed it yesterday. If it's about property rights, visitation rights, that could be done very simply without redefining marriage for the entire universe. Domestic partnerships or by legal decree, period, end of story. It has nothing to do with marriage. It has to do with changing society at its core. The building block of any society is man and woman. I don't care if you're a Syrian. I don't care if you're a Libyan. I don't care if you're a lesbian. I don't care if you're a Staten Islander. The building block of any society is man and woman. Everybody knows that. Gays know that. They came from man and woman. So why do they have to change the structure of the world to reflect their own view of the world? Because they can. Because they control the media. That's why. Now we go on. I'm going to roll here. How many people hate me now? I don't know. I'm not trying to be hated. I am trying to have a discussion here. Let's have one more, which is from Mr. Roberts, who was the man who gave us Obamacare, strangely. Nobody know, know why he, knows why he did that. He was the one who suddenly said it's a tax. It's not a tax. Therefore, it's Obamacare. Yes, you can have Castro care in America. So here's Justice Roberts now in clip four. Um, every definition that I looked up prior to about a dozen years ago defined marriage as a unity between a man and a woman as husband and wife. Uh, obviously, if you succeed, that core definition will no longer be operable. Well, that's obvious. I hope not, Your Honor. Huh? Who's that? What'd she just mutter? Where'd that come from? That's like a tail end that wasn't on there. <clears throat> so then Alito asks, what will be the limits on same-sex marriages? Okay, clip five. It's a good one. Listen to this one. Suppose we rule in your favor in this case, and then after that, a group consisting of two men and two women apply for a marriage license. Would there be any ground for denying them a license? That's all. Polygamy is coming. Polygamy next. Marry a horse next. Want to marry a dog? Sure. Why not marry a dog? It's a nice furry creature. Doesn't bother anybody. Isn't your dog entitled to marriage, too? Tell me why, if you change the name, uh, the definition of the word marriage, you, you cannot marry an animal. Tell me why. Explain that to me. How? How will it be limited? Isn't that a constitutional right to marry your cat or your dog? Now, I'm not comparing gays to cats and dogs. Please don't l lump the two together and make s something out of what I'm not saying. Don't try to do it. It's too late in my career. It's not going to work. You and George Soros and the rats who evade taxes and attack conservatives, you know what, you lost. You didn't win. So the fact of the matter is keep trying that you're not going to get me. I'm too smart for you, number one, and I'm not what you say I am, number two. And the best defense, by the way, for an attack is the truth. So don't try to lump me in with uh, the bigots because I'm the last thing on earth. The last thing on earth I am is a bigot. I am Michael Savage. I am a sexual libertarian. If you care to comment on any of these topics... The phone number is 855-407-282. I shall return. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You know, I don't know if I want to talk about these topics. I'm sick of it all. I'm sick of Baltimore. I'm sick of the white liberals who caused it. I'm sick of the thugs in the street who burnt it. You know, I feel like I'm getting a migraine from all of this. I'm in the talk business. I have to, like, incite you to talk. But I'm not going to just incite you. I don't want to incite you. Many of you are angry over what Obama's done uh, by laying the groundwork for those riots over the last six years. We know what he did. We know what Holder did. We know how they deballed the police. We know what's going on. Now, in the midst of all this, now we have to start talking about redefining marriage. Everything in our lives has to be torn to shreds by the radical left. It's how a revolution functions. Don't you get that? Play the Mel Allen piece for me now. There's a drive hit the deep right field. That ball is going, going. It is gone. Is a wee, a wee lad. A wee lad. Listening to baseball on a portable radio. Imagine me in a polo shirt. All right, it's enough already with sneakers walking around Queens, New York with my ear glued to the, to the World Series. I actually liked sports until I was 12, then I outgrew it. And they say that uh, people have a gambling phase too until they're 12, then they outgrow it. But I outgrew sports. I'd walk around, and this guy's voice was so compelling. 
it said summer to me. It said freedom to me. It said no school. It said everything's good. It said life is normal. There was a man. There was a woman. There was a mother. There was a father. There was marriage. There was family. There was divorce. There was cancer. There was disease. There was happiness. There was sadness. There were gay people. No one, no one did anything to gay people in those days. What do you think? Everybody beat up gays? We know there were gay bars in the, in the village when I grew up in New York. The police knew it too. No one bothered the gay people. All of a sudden comes the 60s, and along with the 60s comes the communist rhetoric. And what they want to do is redefine not just marriage, but society itself. You don't understand this is more than marriage. It has much more to do with redefining the entire society. It's the same type of people who want to disarm the police, who want to disarm marriage. Do you understand what I just said to you? Well, that's my opinion. So play Mel Allen again. And As the drive hits the deep right field, that ball is going, going, it is gone. Maris hitting his second homer of the day. Here's Jane Fulham with the Trulli homer. Sixth homer of the ball game. Too short right, of the that's record. That's enough already. Here's a headline on the Drudge Report. Freddie Gray broke neck and van. No evidence injured during arrest. I don't know what to believe. The other prisoner said he was whacking himself around in the van trying to collect some money. Uh, Freddie Gray broke neck and van. No evidence injured during arrest. How do I know what the truth is? How, how, what do I know, Freddie Gray? I know Freddie Gray from Freddie Pink. But already the whole city burned to the ground because of someone they didn't even know. All of a sudden, Freddie Gray was, was a, a folk hero. Where's the song on Freddie Gray now? An investigation death of Baltimore resident Freddie Gray has found no evidence that his fatal injuries were caused during the videotape arrest and interaction with police. Don't tell the Al Baluno Shopton. I'm sorry, he's on a diet now. Al Skinny Shopton. He's on the same diet as Barack Obama. They must be eating the same food and smoking the same air because they're both losing dr drastic amounts of weight. Uh, anyway, who you think they're going to believe this? If you had a picture of him banging his head on the wall, they would say the police did it. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Boy, it is gone. Maris hitting his second the Simpler the times in America. The simpler times. Blacks and whites sat in a baseball stadium together. Uh, the cancer of hatred had not yet aris arisen because the communists were still in the back wards and the back rooms of America. But now that the insane asylums have been closed down because of Jerry Brown's father, uh, the streets are full of leftists and they're running the country. As a result, the, the nation is in, in, in a state of uh, emotional collapse. Everyone's against everyone else. So it's not bad enough the Islamo-fascists are hunting us. It's not bad enough that our intelligence agencies have been penetrated and are weakened and are not doing their job. It's not bad enough that we're almost at the verge of war with Russia because of Obama and Hillary Clinton. It's not bad enough that Israel could be nuked if uh, John Kerry, the anti-American, is permitted to sign the so-called nuclear deal. No, now we have to focus on redefining the most fundamental building block of a society, marriage. So let's talk about it. Since that's what the Supreme Court is doing, that's what we the people are going to be doing today a little bit on the Savage Nation. KSFO San Francisco. Go ahead, my friend. Eric, you're on the uh, air with Michael Savage and many others. Hey, Michael. Uh, I'm proud to declare that I am a constitutional conservative whose son is getting married this coming weekend uh, and, a, and a believer that, uh, that is something that is a state's rights question. Your son is getting married, I assume, to a, to a man. Isn't that why you're calling? Yes, indeed. Okay, so what is your point? I don't understand your point. My point is that it's not a constitutional question. It's a question of states' rights versus, uh, versus government rights. And it's a question that should be defined at the state level. Uh, and that the ends justify the means. I agree with the end that my, that my son should have the, the, the right to be married. But it's no, hold on. You just said something very telling. You used the phrase right out of the communist playbook. The ends justify the means. Do you understand what you just said? No, what I'm saying is if the means... Well, you just are... said it. You said the ends justify the means. That's a, that's a tenet of Marxism. I'm sorry to, to, to tell you that. You may not even know it. 
Well, I do, but my, my caveat that unfortunately I did not express clearly was only if the means are just. The means being taken right now are not just. Well, what are the means? What do you mean? Well, the, it can be decided by a vote of the people, as has been uh, happened many times, but this legislation... Oh, so you don't want the Supreme Court establishing a precedent in the federal court. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, because it's a question left to the... You mean they'll take it away from states like California that are doing such a wonderful job in so many other areas where they can decide this? It, it should be a state-by-state, state, locality by locality. Well, let's ask another question. You know, I, I have to take you on your word. I don't know if you really have a son who's getting married, but let's say you are. Why does your son need to be married? Tell me what that's about. Sure, because it, his, it is his desire to do so. And it's his desire to express his relationship. And in fact, the point of fact is the reason for them to be married is that is the only way that uh, he can that his spouse can be covered under his health insurance. All right. So it has an economic issue, which I raised yesterday, which I totally agree with. It's all about economics. You know and I know that there are domestic partnerships that could cover the economic issues, the visitation rights. And if states don't permit domestic partnerships, you can do it simply by a legal decree. You don't really need society to redefine marriage to establish that that, uh, fiscal fairness. You're absolutely correct. And this, this goes right back to if the means are just. If the people of a locality believe that this is what they want to do, again, society evolves. But society evolves with the consent of society, not by, uh, uh, by activist judge legislation. So what do you mean if society, sometimes society devolves as a result of activist legislation. Sometimes it evolves. Right. Some, would argue that, some would argue that if you permit the definition of marriage to be redefined, you're devolving marriage. You're not, you're not evolving it. it. But it depends on how that definition comes about. If it is the will of the people... Again, this because and this, this is a discussion that I've had with my son with with respect to I think it was Proposition Eight on the California ballot. Yes, the people voted many times. The first time it was came up, the the defensive marriage was was very very soundly passed by like eighty five percent, something to that effect. Really? Well, how about Proposition 209, which banned affirmative action in public sector jobs? And one rotten, stinking left-wing judge named Felton Henderson nullified the votes of six million people. So your argument goes up in smoke. You can't handpick what the, what the local people can and cannot do. What you're saying is you want this thing to be voted by the people. Then why don't you say you want that upheld as well? I, I, I certainly do. And, and All right. Well, uh, good. Then you're a man of fairness. Absolutely, my follow-up. Are you are you aware of? I want to get into a mysticism for a minute, so we can see this in another realm. People don't know that I'm somewhat of a, even though I sound like I'm not. Sometimes I sound like I'm a longshoreman from the 1950s. There's a part of Michael Savage that's quite mystical. Do you know what Jacob's Ladder refers to? Yeah. Could you please tell the audience what it, in your mind, means? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but isn't that an effort to, to build a ladder to, to heaven or something like that? Okay, that's very fair. And on this ladder to heaven, on Jacob's ladder, there are rungs, meaning steps on the ladder, right? Mm-hmm. The, the Jewish mystics who are totally in favor of protecting the weakest members of society, who they consider to be widows and orphans, by the way, the Jewish mystics, going back a thousand years, believe that a widow and an orphan, even wealthy ones, are the weakest elements of society, and they, they must be taken care of on, on Jacob's ladder. And yet they say, and I'm going to quote now, it is the perversion or confusion of the rungs on the ladder which is the cause of all of our troubles. For evil is simply good out of place. And they give an example. Peace, they say, peace. Peace. So high an ideal on our rung of values may, if it is placed too high, become evil, as when Aaron wanted peace above all and gave the people their idols. And it is the confusion of the rungs which will often cause difficulty, as when one tries to satisfy a spiritual hunger through the physical, or when a person tries to satisfy a physical need through the spiritual. Now you're saying, what does that have to do with gay marriage? maybe something and maybe nothing. 
I think that we're missing the picture here. And I think that we're, we're misinterpreting where this rung on the ladder to heaven belongs. It shouldn't be at the top of the ladder. I, I understand your point entirely, and there is a distinction between the legal entity and the spiritual entity of marriage. Well, now we're talking. That's something no one's even mentioned yet. You know, in all these, these discussions, Eric, no one has talked about the spiritual dimension of marriage, only about the legal definition of marriage. Michael, all I can tell you is, you know, just as you ha- have provided different vision or perspective, there are those of us who also have a different vision or perspective. I totally respect that, by the way, and I think you understand that, or else you wouldn't have called the show. If you thought I was just a pig-headed right-winger, you wouldn't have called. Uh, okay, Michael, what I want Oh, hold it. That laughter means I'm wrong, huh? No, 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 no. Not at all. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you feel or believe, but how many people in talk radio would have taken the discussion of, of gay marriage and taken it to Jacob's ladder to heaven? Nobody but me. No. I don't know if I made. I don't know if I made my point, but you picked on some. You picked up on some part of it. I think that's very important, which is that there is a spiritual dimension to marriage that everyone seems to understand, and we think that by redefining marriage, we're changing the whole spiritual nature of the word marriage and the meaning of marriage. Agreed. All right. Well, maybe we, maybe we somewhat moved each other in some direction. All I can say is bless you on your son's marriage, if that's what you want. And and what can I say? If I had had a gay child and he was getting married, I'd probably feel the same way you do. But I've been very lucky because my children are not gay, and I say that with all sincerity. I think it's a it's a burden. I don't think it's a gift. I, well, I agree with you, and I also agree with the perspective on the white owl, which we discussed earlier of your your dream. Uh, but whoa, uh, but wait, whoa, whoa, this is interesting. You remember the white owl show from five weeks ago? Tell me how it relates to this discussion. Well, it relates in that, Michael, you had said that nobody else in talk radio would take the point of view of spirituality and legal definition. And brought in Jacob's Ladder, nobody else in talk radio would have done the White Owl show the way you did. So I take it you listen on a fairly regular basis. I hope you're not angry at me for anything I've said. I've tried not to be, uh, you know, somewhat let's say insensitive to your situation or or those listening to me across the country, but I feel that marriage is between a man and a woman. I believe that gay people have every right to have the financial stability that straight people have, and I think it can be done either through domestic partnerships or through a a few legal letters would cover visitation and inheritance rights. That's my feeling. Uh, And I don't think the entire society at a time like this needs to be rattled, and yet it is being rattled, so we'll see what the Supremes do, Eric. Eric, please accept a new a copy of my forthcoming delicious novel, Countdown to Mecca. There's absolutely nothing to do with sexuality in it other than, uh, <clears throat> you know, the sexuality of the Muslims, in this case, the radical Muslims who kill gays, and why the generals decide to, to off them in one fell swoop. This is The Savage Nation. The phone number is 855 the novel Countdown to Mecca will be out, but it's not next week. It's the week after. It won't be in the stores till then. I, I thought it was in the stores next week. So I brought up a little mysticism because I don't think everything is what it appears to be. And I think there are other dimensions to reality. I always have known that my whole life. We all do. We seem to think that we're two-dimensional creatures, sometimes maybe three-dimensional creatures. But sometimes I think we're multidimensional creatures. And I believe that there's more to, the, to any picture that meets the eye, including why Islam is on the rise, why the West is falling, and why America, in the midst of all of this, is obsessed with a situation such as gay marriage. I believe that there's a spiritual element to this entire picture that we can touch on if you want. How about the Baltimore riots? What would the spiritual element of that be? Why is that happening again? Why is it suddenly 1968? Why do we have minority mayors who tell the police to not, to not fight back against the rioters? And they only stopped the rioters, only stopped when the National Guard came out and had guns in their hands. Why are communists in New York City who have nothing to do, kids from the colleges who have nothing to do, usually kids from middle class houses, especially those radical girls, 
running around with knapsacks all over all over New York trying to burn things down, attacking police. Why? Why are they permitted to run rampant in the streets? Why? What's the spiritual meaning of all of this? Well, there's a lot of simple answer to it all, and then there's a complex answer to all, and then, of course, there's no answer to it. I'd rather talk about the no answer. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Can you imagine a human mind capable of creating such phenomenal music? And we're sitting here down on our earth watching idiots run around with knapsacks attacking police, burning cities. And we're supposed to believe that we're living in ascended times. We're supposed to believe we're living in progressive times. We're supposed to believe that we're living in times that are advanced. I would argue the opposite. My contemporary insights would tell me something else. And I, I tried to tell you this whole argument of gay marriage for one moment. Just remove the word gay and marriage from what I'm about to say and go back to my analogy of Jacob's Ladder because I want to do the mystical thing for one minute. What is Jacob's Ladder? Sulam Yaakov is a staircase to heaven that the biblical patriarch Jacob dreams about during his flight from his brother Esau. It is described in the book of Genesis. He dreamed. He lay, he lay his head on a rock, if you read Genesis, and he put the rock under his head, and he dreamed of a staircase to heaven. And he woke up and there was a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, Christians believe Jesus is the staircase to heaven. Muslims believe in this concept of a staircase to heaven. Islam, in fact, in, in, in legitimate Islam, before the maniacs stole the religion, Jacob is revered in Islam as a prophet and patriarch. And legitimate Muslim scholars draw a parallel with Jacob's vision of the latter in Muhammad's event of mirage. So what am I trying to say to you? Is that for one minute, change your view of everything and understand we just take the metaphor of Jacob's ladder, a staircase to heaven. And the mystics would argue, for example, that if you change the order of the rungs, you can destroy everything. If you pervert or confuse the rungs on Jacob's ladder, all of our troubles can be seen for what they are. And they give an example. They say peace, for example, so high an ideal on our rung of values, may, if it is placed too high on the ladder, become evil, as when Aaron wanted peace above all and gave the people their idols. But now let's take Obama and Kerry. They want peace with Iran above all, so they put the rung of peace at the top of the ladder to heaven, right? Right? And what will we get as a result? Will we get peace with Iran? No. I'm proving to you once again that the Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism has the answer. The fragrance of Eden in Obama's mind is to be had with anything to do with Iran. He smells Eden. You say Iran, he smells Eden. And so he places the rung of peace above all on his ladder. And what do you think will happen? This confusion by Obama and Kerry will not give us peace. It will give us the opposite of peace. Now let's take it back down to gay marriage. You think that by redefining marriage, we are going to have the fragrance of Eden here on earth? The opposite will occur. And I don't want to embroider on my statement. I want to leave it at exactly at that point. I'll let you interpret what I just said. This is Michael Savage. I hope you've enjoyed the hour. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, 
And here he is, Michael Zevin. Well, here we are, 50 years after the 60s, where we were taught to eliminate all repression, to let it all hang out. If it feels good, do it. Why not do it in the road? So let's go back to the biblical injunction, quote, hide thyself not from thine own flesh. What does that mean? Hide thyself not from thine own flesh. It's a commandment to stop denying your own body pleasure. Did you know that? And so then people say, all right, well, I'll enjoy pleasure. Companionship of a wife, companionship of a husband. When some people lose a wife or a husband, they die themselves because they become only half a person. So it's a sacred institution. We've known of these cases of a man and a woman married for many years. One of them dies, the other dies within days or weeks. And they became, because they became one. And that is a beautiful story. And that's a story that has carried mankind on the ship of life from the beginning of recorded history. And now we sit where people want to change this simple definition of reality. And they want to change reality itself. And that's what we're talking about. Reality itself. Can you actually say there's a thing called gay marriage? Is that reality? Well, it's the reality of some people, but it's not the reality of most of the world through recorded history. Say, well, all right, time to change recorded history. Time to change your reality. We may be 1%, but we want to tell you what reality is. And so although you think of marriage, you think of a wedding and a woman in a white dress and a man in a tuxedo, it could be to us two men in tuxedos or two women in two dresses or two women in tuxedos or two men in two dresses. In other words, we want to shake it all up. We want our view of the world to be your view of the world. Now, we live in an open society. We don't live in Iran. And as a result, people can do what they want. That's a good thing. And yet at a certain point, freedom becomes slavery. Orwell wrote that. The more I hear people screaming, I am free, I am free, I am free, the more I hear their chains rattling. So that opens up the discussion of gay marriage. Don't think it's as simple as you may think. The arguments before the Supreme Court are strictly legalistic. But there are other dimensions to this subject, which is what I want to get into now. And these dimensions include the mystical, the spiritual, and the religious. Because there are other dimensions to this discussion. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're trying to give you a different perspective on things. I'm trying to open the mind, open up the heart, open up the mind, open up the heart to the bigger picture on this. And it's, uh, it, it, it's an insight of my own based upon the insights of others. And we're talking about the hidden wisdom of this discussion, discussion if there is any wisdom in it. And I brought up Jacob's Ladder in the last hour and the Stairway to Heaven in the last hour. And I was talking about how the Jewish mystics teach that one of the great confusions on earth is when people take the myth or the thought of Jacob's ladder and they mix up the rungs on the ladder and they put the rungs of the ladder in the wrong order. And as a result, the opposite happens from what you wish to occur. And so the gay community, the radical gay community in particular, wishes to live in Eden. And they believe that if they can redefine marriage, the fragrance of Eden will become Eden itself. If only they can get straight society to redefine marriage itself, they will all be in Eden. We all know that that's not true. There is no Eden on earth. But <clears throat> So therefore, all of society is now being shaken to its core by this issue of gay marriage. The religious people in particular, most people don't care about it, incidentally. You take the average person, the intelligent person, what do they care? They'll say, you know, I don't really care whether gays get married. How is it going to affect me? That's the modern view. The average 35-year-old person is not stupid. They, had, they have children maybe, married themselves. They could care less whether gays are allowed to get married. They say, how will it affect me? How will it affect me, they ask. It won't affect me. I'm straight. I don't care. It's not going to make me gay. It's not going to affect me or my children. Why should I care? That's the average opinion. The religious people say that they'd rather die than perform a gay marriage because it violates everything they believe in. That's the religious Christians now are standing up saying they will con commit to civil disobedience if the justices come down on this in the wrong way for them. 
And the other side says they will do the same. Of course, so there it is. We, the people, talking about gay marriage today, have all these issues to discuss. I don't expect you to change your opinion as a result of my discussion, my leading this discussion. Uh, but maybe it will, maybe it won't. My position was stated yesterday, and I'll repeat it again today. And my position is simple, which is I, I'm a sexual libertarian. I sincerely mean that. I don't care what you do to stimulate your pleasure without being vulgar about it. That's your business. Life is very complicated. Life is horrendously difficult for most of us. And if you get a little pleasure, uh, whatever you have to do without hurting anybody, or without hurting yourself, good luck to you. That's your business. However, I draw the line with children. And I believe that redefining marriage uh, as anything but a marriage between a man and a woman confuses our children. I didn't say that the children in gay marriages suffer. I didn't say that children in gay marriages can't be brought up equal to, if not better than some straight marriages. I never said that. But I believe you have a child who's growing up who's three, four, five years old. And he sees a man and a woman on an altar. He understands what it is. He understands what he is expected or she is expected to do to go forward as a human being in a civilized society to procreate and bring forth new life. It's as simple as that. How hard is that? Now confuse the child and show, show the child two men on an altar being married. Now confuse the child and show them two women. I didn't say the women are evil. I didn't say the men are evil. Don't misinterpret me. I'm talking from the viewpoint of the innocent child. Try to understand what I'm saying to you, the innocent, beautiful child. The innocent, beautiful child, that's what I'm talking about. So I've said an awful lot, hide thyself not from thine own flesh is how I started. And we talked about Jacob's ladder in the last hour. There's a lot to talk about. And if you care to join the conversation, 855-400-7282. Do you remember what it's like to be a child? Artists can understand that. And I want to go back to Greek philosophy for a minute on that. Just for a minute, indulge me. Plato thought that all poetry and music and, 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 and art and even holy yearnings come from, quote, the song of our soul, from that place which is the treasure house of everything. And what does he mean by that? Again, you have to look into the mystical statement, the mystical meaning of that. It means the same thing that Oscar Wilde meant when he talked about his garden where, quote, every blade of grass, every plant, every flower sings its song. Have you ever felt that? Some of you have when you were children. Some of you felt it when you were on LSD or on mescaline or high on pot. I mean, let's be real. That's many people indulge in drugs in order to be a child again, where they get so wrapped up in a single blade of grass that they actually do return themselves to that simplicity, which I'm not arguing for the use of drugs. I hate them, by the way, because I think it messes up the mind of a Stradivarius. If you have the mind of a banjo, fine, go use, go use LSD. But if you're blessed with a Stradivarius mind, you don't need to, to plunk the strings until they're discordant. So we go back to the child again, and we go back to the biblical and Talmudic imagery of angels as children angels are children and what does it say for the child knows how to be amazed everything in him is new the sky the sun the stars mother father the doll he participates in the biblical statement which is and god saw all that he had made and it was very good and then what happens to us when we're adults we see no mystery we see no freshness it's all gone. We've, we've clouded over the freshness that we saw as a child with book learning, names, categories, society, fears, and the inner worlds, the inner wonder is buried. And you can't achieve what the mystics call the upper whiteness, that primal openness, that primal openness that children understand. So what does this have to do with tearing apart the institution of marriage. What does it do to our children? We're all so selfish that we talk only about our needs. But what about the children? Is this good for the children to see this? Think about what I just said to you in the context in which I presented it. It was far beyond the black and the white. I took you into other areas. I gave you a rainbow view. 
And I'll be back in a few minutes to pick up your calls right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Approaching the mysticism. I think that's what I'm going to be doing with the rest of my life anyway. I am so not in this dimension anymore. I feel like I've taken a step on another ladder, and I don't know when it started. It could have happened the other night, for all I know. But let's talk about this from a pragmatic point of view without me getting into my personal belief system or where I'm coming from or where I'm going. We had a caller who said his son is getting married. He's gay. San Francisco. Very nice caller, very nice gentleman. And he said he thinks it should be decided on a on local law, state law, not federal law, that the Supremes have no right giving one blanket opinion. And a very intelligent listener just sent me this. She says, a Sharia Muslim community could then vote that female circumcision is legal and all women must be circumcised. A Jewish Orthodox community could dictate that all have to keep kosher or whatever the laws may be. And so therefore you cannot permit local law to trump federal law in this case. Because if you did, then you could say, well, some local law would like to trump federal civil rights law. They don't want the EEOC in their community. Go away. I mean, you, you, see, you see, understand, you can't have it both ways. <clears throat> so this is a very interesting case. This is why we're all talking about it. And the Supreme Court is talking about it. Let's take a quick caller. Line number one, Sheldon on KCMO in Kansas City. Welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Yeah, Michael, um, I wanted to give you a quick testimony. You know, back in the day when I was listening to you for 10 years, I was like in excruciating pain as a pastor and was just, uh, my life was so bleak, black, dark, and God used you to just like, you were one of the only sources in my life other than my granddaughter uh, that could bring any kind of happiness into my life. And one time somebody called you and said, Michael, should we have children? And... Uh, and I remember listening so closely, because at that point I was prepared to get my six daughters together and apologize to them for bringing them into the world. Mm. Without any hesitation, instantaneously after he presented his case, he said, I'm a young man, we don't know if we want to bring any children into the world. Without any hesitation, you said, absolutely, you have to have children, because they're the future. People had children in concentration camps. And the thing is, I, 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 over the years, I've just seen that the, I, I tell people, I said, it's like there's a, this, uh, the DNA of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are just straining their morality to, and Moses to just speak through your voice. Not that I always agree with everything, and one of your postures that you've taken in recent times, or you know, you've always taken it towards homosexuality, is a sort of, uh, you know, a gesture of magnanimity, and, you know, sexual libertarianism, which is, you know, it doesn't really matter. Do what you want to do. But would you feel that way, you know, if you knew that it might, you know, end up in wrecking everything? And we should, you know, if you look at the history of nations, you see that the wise men in all generations, they sought to discourage homosexuality. And they realized some of them, that, you know, it's going to exist in the society, but just like adultery and fornication, we don't take those things and put them before the people and say, now, this is a good thing. That's the difference here. Like, what would happen in our schools if our teachers would get up with the students and, and uh, say, today we're going to talk about adultery. This is a good thing. Of course not. Everybody knows that it exists in our society, and we've seen the destruction that it wreaks in people's lives. Nobody likes to see a home broken up through an adulterous affair, whatever, it happens, but you don't call it a good thing. And the thing is, the consequences of putting this thing in, into law and calling it a good thing is very severe. If you look at the ancient cultures, essentially when they, they wound down and disintegrated, it always had to do with immorality of all kinds. Now, we're given one example in history, of course, in the book of Genesis, whether you believe in God or not, I think it, it, it goes to show that you could say that even if God didn't send down, uh, you know, fire and destruction, 
that basically uh, cultures self-destruct when they get so sexually immoral. And it's like, and it begins by taking something that the wise men in all generations have essentially said, this isn't a good thing. We don't want to celebrate it. We certainly don't want to make it legal. But hold on. If, if you want to go to the Bible, and I, you, you said so many things, I can only pick one point of departure. And it's not to disagree with you necessarily, but we should not glorify the ancients. Because at the risk of doing so, by doing so, we risk losing perspective on here. For example, in Genesis, we learn that Lot inseminated his own daughters. Where's the morality in that? Well, it just, just uh, it, it, it's not, there's a lot of things in the Bible that don't... It says, our father is old and there is not a man on the earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. You know, the Bible is quite a rich piece of literature, uh, Sheldon. And I heard everything that you said. And I'm not saying that I believe in gay marriage, that it should be the law of the land. I never said that. I never said that. On the other hand, I don't think we have any right to dictate to people what their sexual behavior ought to be. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. We're talking about beauty, we're talking about truth, but ultimately, even if we're discussing something as prosaic as the law, uh, which can be quite ele elegant, by the way, to the lawyer who studies the law rather than uses the law, we're talking about gay marriage, which ultimately comes down to a discussion of human happiness, isn't it? Have you heard anyone put it in that context? Happiness, we're talking about human happiness. We do every day when we talk politics. The Republicans say that you will be happier if you vote Republican. Hillary Clinton, the demagogue, says you will be happier if you let me take money from those who earned it and give it to those who don't earn it. You will be happier, more people will be happier. They're promising happiness. So everything that we are talking about on radio or actually in our life is usually about happiness. Right? So where am I going with this? Well, let me explain it to you in another way. Things happen to us in life that sometimes are bad, and we say they're bitter. But you know that medicines can be both bitter, and sometimes they can give you a sweet medicine, honey-coated. So bitterness sometimes can be a good medicine. And the most important thing I want to say to you is, is this, and it's a mystical statement in its own way. If you read the mystical teachings of the ancient Jews, the Kabbalists, they will say to you, a person should not become depressed by his sins, for this is Satan's device for separating us even further from God. That's something that can put things upside down for you. Many of us sin, all of us sin one way or another, little sins, big sins, and then some of us get depressed from our sins which makes us sin even more. We know the cycle, right? And that's the mistake we make because the mystics say that is Satan's device for separating us even further from God and we spiral out of control. So what you must do is look for the holy sparks of God, if you want to call it God, which can be found even in sinful situations. I don't know if I explained it properly to you, but I went through a very deep period in my own life of soul searching, I don't know how many years ago, it doesn't matter. And it was only when I came upon that idea that even in mistakes, even in so-called sin, could we find God, that there is no pure evil on earth. That I realized that there's much more to dimensions of reality than we imagine. And then I, I was able to understand, for example, you look at the moon. The moon has a, a light side and a dark side, but it's still the moon. But you have to look at the whole moon. It's not a two-dimensional sphere. It's a sphere, <laughs> okay? And we are a sphere. Some of us are like moon men. We're, we're light and dark all day long, up and down, up and down, up and down. We deal with it. And when I get on the radio, I've, I've said as recently as today to somebody that I fly like an eagle for three hours a day, and for 21 hours a day, I crawl like a worm 
Well, right now, I'm trying to help you understand that this issue of gay marriage goes far beyond the legalistic discussions that are going on inside the Supreme Court. It's a discussion and a result, and the result of this discussion will change society forever one way or the other. That's how seminal this topic is. So we can play the sound bites. And, for example, let's play clip number five, which is Justice Alito on the limits of same-sex marriage. Suppose we rule in your favor in this case, and then after that, a group consisting of two men and two women apply for a marriage license. Would there be any ground for denying them the license? Well, there you go. And then the swing voter is Justice Anthony Kennedy. He's, you know, it's always split, and there's always one swing voter, Kennedy, and he usually determines the outcome of a Supreme Court case. He seems to be tilting against gay marriage in clip eight. Listen to this. When you think about these cases, you think about words or cases, and, and the word that keeps coming back to me in this case is, is millennia plus time. This definition has been with us for millennia. And it, it, it's very difficult for the court to say, oh, well, we, 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 we know better. See, so the swing voter, Justice Kennedy, is saying the court doesn't have the right to change millennia of understanding of marriage. At least that's what he's saying. Whether he will vote that way is another story. Then we have this interesting exchange between Sam Alito on why polygamy shouldn't be illegal if you pass gay marriage. And you have two sides of the argument in clip nine that are worth listening to. Well, what if there's no, these are four people, two men and two women. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, the sort of polygamous relationship, polygamous marriages that existed in other societies and still exist in some societies today. And let's say they're all, they're all consenting adults, highly educated. They're all lawyers. Uh, <laughs> what would be the ground under, under the logic of the decision you would like us to hand down in this case, what would be the logic of denying them the same right? The lot, number one, I assume the states would rush in and say that when you're talking about multiple people joining into a relationship, that that is not the same thing that we've had in marriage, which is on the mutual support and consent of two people. Setting that aside, even assuming it is within but, the but, fundamental well, right. Well, I, I don't know what kind of a distinction that is, because a, a marriage between two people of the same sex is not something that we have had before. So you can see it's a much more complicated argument than it appears to be. Let's take some uh, calls uh, on the savage. Now, remember what we're talking about here. The gay community believes they will be happy if the justices decide that gay marriage shall be the law of the land. Religious people and others are saying they will be unhappy unless the justices say the opposite. The rioters in Baltimore felt they would be happy if they burned the city to the ground and robbed toilet paper, booze, and sneakers. Now they're happy. They have toilet paper, they have booze and sneakers, and their city's burned to the ground. The very stores that they sacked, ransacked, are gone. But they're, they were happy, weren't they? Isn't happiness the point? Well, they burnt the city to the ground. The little college girls in New York were tying up the Holland Tunnel and running in the streets. They're having the best time of their lives, hoping to get lucky, uh, meeting a, 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 a hipster with a beard. Maybe have sex under the under the bridge. Uh, they think this, they're revolutionaries like uh, Lenin and Marx. They think that if they bring the society down in New York and elsewhere, they will be happy. They're going to erect a new society and they'll be very happy. All of our motivations are based upon happiness. The new Black uh, Panthers, they said they're like the founding fathers and they're willing to kill white people for the black nation they want. They'll be happy if they kill. Wherever you look, the Islamists... The world will be a happier place if they kill the infidel or convert the infidel. So everything is based upon human happiness when you think about it. Whether you eat, whether you don't eat, whether you run, whether you don't run, whether you play ball or don't play ball, you buy a new car or don't buy a new car, go on a yacht, don't go on a yacht, buy a new house, don't buy a new house, put in a new deck, take out the old deck, buy a new couch, not buy a new couch, get a haircut, don't get a haircut. Get a tongue uh, screw. Don't get a tongue screw. Get a tattoo. Don't get a tattoo. It's all based upon the myth of happiness, isn't it? Yeah, Robert's shaking his head. I think I'm going to give lessons in mysticism. I think after this show, I'm going to offer seminars starting in June and July, small groups of seminars. Michael Savage on, on the meaning of mysticism, mysticism and human life. 
I would go to such a thing if I, if I, I got like, a guy like me was giving the talk. But I don't want to face idiots. You see, this is the problem. I don't mean people who don't understand me. I mean people who will disrupt me. And I, that's why I don't do any kind of speeches, by the way. I'm, I'm distracting you from the discussion at hand. Many in talk radio give speeches every week. God bless them. I don't. Because I've been made into someone as controversial as I'm not. They think I'm more controversial than I am. I guess that's a good thing, but I'm really not controversial. I'm a pragmatist and a realist. But the fact is, is that if I were to give seminars, you'd get idiots trying to disrupt me. Then I'd have to hire security guards to disrupt the disruptors. I don't need it. But I'm tempted anyway because I like people well enough to want to sit with a group of people as I saw in the dream of the White Owl. Remember I told you that White Owl dream two months ago? I saw myself in a seminar room somewhere in a forested area. It was a sort of a modern room and there were like 25, 30 people and I was doing small seminars. Well, there it is. It's happening right now, but I'm doing large seminars on, on the Savage Nation. This is the forum. Here we are. You're sitting in that room. I'm sitting in that room with you. We're here to discuss a very important issue and how the court will decide is their business. <laughs> They're going to decide, not us. Unless you actually believe they listen to people. I don't know. Do they? You think they do? I think they do. Michael on WMAL in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Yes, Michael, I called in to discuss with you uh, what happened to me as a psychologist who is a religious Jew. But I wanted to take up the mystical side, too, because uh, you're dealing with it right now. There's such a concept as, uh, it's called in Hebrew, Gavur um, Shebechesed. Uh, what that means is that every trait that a person has has to have some kind of discipline. If you let it uh, express itself uh, to the nth degree, it's only going to bring destruction. So, for example, we have a principle in Judaism which says, those who are merciful to the cruel will in the end be, mer be cruel to the merciful. That's what happened to me. I was a psychologist. I, and now I'm a recovered psychologist. I wanted to help people. And when people would walk in, if they had a problem, one man with his lover, I had to help them repair it, help them be, be even better at what they were doing, which in my mind was not a right, but which was an ill that needed to be healed. So to make a long story short, I ended up being forced to resign because I worked for the government, and I was told, Michael, when you work for us, you have to be ready to help all kinds of people. You can't all right, that's the Soviet way. That's what was done in, in Stalin's Russia. The government dictated to doctors how to practice medicine. That's exactly what's happening in America. We become the Soviet states of America. I understand that. Well, that's why I'm saying those who are merciful to the cruel will in the end be cruel to the merciful, because as much as you let this happened, letting it out of the closet, you force the decent people, the moral people, the religious people into the closet. They become marginalized. They become hated. Why? Because hedonism, which is at the root of, of what this debate uh, is concerned with, means that if somebody um, says that they're going to control, help you to control yourself so you won't give in to your ego and let everything uh, go, then they're seen as a, um, an enemy and they need to be destroyed. And that's why we see in America now that there are 800 rabbis who signed on a, a paper going to the Supreme Court saying that we don't want you to cross this line, and you have pastors liable doing the same thing. So really, we need to know that... But you've never seen the gay community go after any Jews, have you? Not yet, but we did. No, they've only gone after the Catholic Church. They wrecked the Catholic Church uh, to the point where the Catholic Church is hardly functional. And now we have an archbishop in San Francisco simply putting out the tenets of his own church, and they're calling him Hitler, basically. Well, I have to counter that a little bit, because in the case of Nazi Germany, uh, like Ernst Röhm and uh, the SS, they were all chosen because of their cruel streaks that they had in them. In fact, in the concentration camps, those who had these cruel streaks oftentimes became uh, commandants. And in the case of Ernst Röhm, uh, they were especially looking for Jewish people because, uh, like Hitler... Well, what does the Ernst Rome have to do with the Catholic Archbishop? I, I missed that, that link. I'm talking about how Hitler said his war is with the Jews because they are the conscious of the... Okay, but wait, we're missing, we're getting off track here. I don't understand what this has to do with gay marriage. Well, gay marriage is really something that is cruel, not something which is 
uh, out of love. For, you're saying from the Jewish point of view, gay marriage is cruel? Yes. But number one reason is because it's all selfish. It's all egotistical. It means that they want a momentary pleasure instead of self-sacrifice and, and as much as they would do with a... Well, how a does wife. that differ from... How, how, not, see, I don't know that I understand or agree with you. How does... How do gay people wanting to live together, let's say, take the word marriage out of it, because it would give them pleasure, differ from straight people wanting to live together because it will give them pleasure? I don't follow that. Because what straight people have is not a seeking of a momentary pleasure in, in a global sense. They want to do something which will continue the generations further, further which is what God does when he says, I bless those who uh, with this... Um, with, with, uh, replenishing the earth and with uh, ca causing people to inhabit it. Uh, why? Because the more people who inhabit the world, the more they can give glory and respect and honor to God and His commandments. When you have someone, uh, be it an individual homosexual, or, uh, and by the way, that's a Greek term that doesn't lend any more understanding of this. It doesn't help. It really obfuscates it. Uh, when you have somebody who does it, not by self-sacrifice in order to bring children into the world, which is why the so which is also a misnomer, because there's only one kind of sex. It has to do with men and women. The others are deviations of it. So when a person um, is showing self-sacrifice by putting his own children... All right, so you're giving us the Jewish biblical point of view, which totally opposes gay marriage, is what you're saying. Right, and in the case of love... Hold on. Now, what this will lead to is the burning of Bibles. In time, eventually, just as the Catholic Church was attacked, Bibles will be burned. Because the Bible is very clear in Genesis when it says, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. That can't be allowed in the new America, could it? Think about it back in a moment. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. From the esoteric to the pragmatic, uh, the Freddie Gray Baltimore thing. New headline, law enforcement sources say Freddie Gray suffered head injury in the police van. And that his head injury matches a bolt in the back of the van. Sources said the medical examiner found Gray's catastrophic injury was caused when he slammed into the back of the police transport van, apparently breaking his neck. And a head injury he sustained matches a bolt in the back of the van. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you he wasn't constrained in his seat and they stopped short. And he flew into the back of the van and died. It means that uh, someone's culpable here. It doesn't mean that you burn a city to the ground. It means you go to court. That's what it means, idiots. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Hour number three, The Savage Nation. We continue our discussion of gay marriage. Lots of calls. Uh, people have strong opinions on both sides of this issue. And a new report came out on the incident in Baltimore with the man Freddie Gray. He did not get injured in the scuffle with the police, but it said that he died after his head slammed into a bolt in the police van. New information on gray death. His fatal spinal cord injuries were caused during the arrest. No. Nope. No evidence caused during the arrest. Not injured by the police during the arrest. But 
New information says the catastrophic injury was caused when he slammed into the back of the police transport van, apparently breaking his neck, and that a head injury he sustained matches a bolt in the back of the van. Now, no one knows what caused Gray to slam into the back of the van. It's unclear whether it was voluntary or whether it was a result of some other action, such as the driver lurching the car and bringing it to an abrupt halt to injure him. As the rioters would have you have you believe, I don't know. I don't know. We'll ever know. All I know is that burning a city to the ground to rob six rolls of toilet paper and a bottle of booze uh, makes no sense to me whatsoever. But let's go to the callers on the issue of the day, which is the Supreme Court talking about gay marriage. Let's go to WABC in New York. Rich, you've been holding a while. Go ahead, please make your point. I love your show. Uh, we're about the same age. Our views and thoughts about the thing, which I'll keep off the air at this point, are pretty much the same. But as far as the subject of gay marriage itself goes, I don't believe it should be permitted. I believe that people that are gay should have every single right that a married couple should have. But to stop this thing of the marriage, for the simple reason, I don't think it's about the marriage. I think it's about acceptance. No religious backgrounds or anything like that. It's about acceptance. If only we could get married, we would feel whole. If only we could come out of the closet, we would feel whole. If only we could have a parade in the middle of the city and state our pride, we would feel whole. If you keep going, they will keep going, too because they're never going to feel whole. There'll always be a segment of society that permits what they do. They're open to it, but they don't condone it personally. And that's what they want. They want universal acceptance of everybody. So hopefully within their own psyche, they can feel they accept it. Because to me, you know, if you're a self-actualized human being, and whether you like women or men or whatever... You don't need to get married or, you know, as long as you can live together in peace and be left alone by people, what difference does it make what other people think? But All it, right, you may, I mean, you make your point. I think that most people would agree with you. Not all. Some will say no. We're humans. We're entitled to all of the legal protections that straight people have. I, the only thing I, 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 I think is bad about it from my own personal thing, which I said I wouldn't get into, is that I think it does a disservice to the children. Because well, that's what I said from the beginning. It confuses children. I think exactly. So you agree with me that it's about the children. It's always about the children, isn't it? I mean, that's what life is about here. I mean, we're not going to live forever. It's about our posterity. All right. So if you take a five-year-old or a six-year-old child and you see two men getting married uh, on a whatever, walking down the aisle, what does it say to a five-year-old child? It opens up a part of their psyche. The child may say, you know, Mommy, can I marry Bobby, my best friend? Because children are not sexualized at five or six. And usually boys like boys and girls like girls. So if they see a thing like this, they figure it's perfectly normal for the boy to marry his friend. That's right. Yep. Or so it's confusing for the child. I mean, it's common sense. That, exactly. That's it in a nutshell. It is Whatever happened to common sense? Do we not care about society as a whole? Do we not care about the next generation? Do we not care about the health of a society? Now the gay argument be, yes, we do. We care about all those things, and we're entitled to health, too, and happiness. And yeah. to get their health and happiness, they want to change all of society's view of what marriage means. Unfortunately, in the world... I don't think that the Supreme Court's going to uphold gay marriage, personally, by what I see. Do you? By what I hear them saying? No, I, I, I think that uh, I don't, you can't tell because common sense seems to be lacking not only in this, in this theater, but also in the theater in Washington. There is no common sense left in the world today. That's what it seems like to me. With every Well, but the questions that the Supremes are asking are commonsensical. And, and Scalia is asking, do you agree that ministers will not have to conduct same-sex marriages? Will the clergy have the rights to not do a marriage? Robert says, uh, you know, the definition itself will no longer be operable. Roberts is the, is the uh, Supreme Court justice who gave us Obamacare. Listen to clip number four. Um, every definition that I looked up prior to about a dozen years ago defined marriage as unity between a man and a woman as husband and wife. Uh, obviously, if you succeed, that core definition will no longer be operable. So you can see by that that Roberts is opposed to it, right? So how is this going to come down? Let's, let's run a scenario. 
The Supreme Court says gay marriage is not legal in 50 states. What happens next? Well, we have riots again. They burn this in Baltimore now. I, I don't know. I, I mean, is that what's going to happen? Is that America now? Unless you burn a city to the ground, you don't get what you want? <laughs> that's another thing that's no common sense at all. <laughs> well, the only ones who don't seem to burn cities down and attack the police are the, are the conservatives. The backbone of America, the people who work, go to work every day and don't have time for that nonsense, are the only ones who don't burn cities to the ground and, and attack police. How is that possible? When is this reaction ever going to come? When in the world will we ever see the taxpayers going out in the streets and saying enough is enough, we're not putting up with this or with that, and now we're going out in the streets? When will 10 million of us go out there and demand that our country be given back to us from the fanatics and the destructive elements? When? WPMO in uh, Mississippi. Linda, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? I can't hear out of that here. Linda, you're on the Savage Nation. Speak up. Oh, okay. I had to hand the phone to my husband for a second. Okay. For the religious fanatics out there, I'd like to throw this out to them. Um, I'm going to give them Isaiah 56, um, verse 3 through 5. It says, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people, neither let the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep thy Sabbath and cheat. Well, Linda, give me your opinion, please. I, 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 I don't know what you're, you're quoting the New Testament in an attempt to make a point, and what is that point? Okay, the point is that God acknowledges that he made some people different, and you can refer to him as eunuchs or whatever you want to refer to. I'm just saying Isaiah 56, 3 through 5, says that people are made that way, and he gives them a blessing. So they're obviously uh, people that are not hated by God. Um, but then on the other hand, you go over to Matthew in the Bible, um, 19. Well, so you're looking for your guidance from the Bible in terms of how you want to look upon gay marriage. Have you heard once on this show me saying anything negative about gay people per se? No. We're talking only about gay marriage. It's a separate issue, isn't it? Well, that's the point that I'm eventually trying to get to. Maybe I need to narrow it down. Um, I don't think it should be called marriage. I think that there in the past, in previous ancient societies and other societies, there's been a place for people that are outside the norm, but they didn't call it marriage in respect to raising children and that kind of thing. They maybe had jobs in a king's palace, you know, taking care of the king's harem or something else, but they didn't. <laughs> well, come on now. We're not living in ancient biblical times. In plain English, are you for or against gay marriage, redefining the meaning of the word marriage? I'm against the term marriage for them. I, I don't want to call it marriage. I don't want to take away their rights. I think it should have a different name, and they should have... Well, what would you call it? Gay what? Uh, I haven't even had time to think of a name for it, but, like, if you have someone that you love and care about, and they're your roommate, and you're on your deathbed, and your roommate's got to make choices about life and death, for you to have surgery or something, there needs to be something in place for that. A hundred percent agreed. A hundred percent right from a legalistic point of view, from a financial point of view, there must be some codified law to, uh, to establish equality here. And that law is on the books in some states under the domestic partnership laws. In any other state where domestic partnerships are not legal, this can be done with a simple legal letter. Do you know that? Right, and even... Well, you don't have to redefine the, the, the institution of marriage to have those rights. Right, I agree. So that's, that's where I come down on it. Everyone should have equal rights. However, you don't have to redefine the fundamental core belief of most of the world in order to get those rights. It's that simple. So we're seeing the legal argument right now from the, from the, uh, <clears throat> from the Supreme Court point of view. And I think I would be remiss unless I play the other side of the argument, which is Mary Bonato arguing for gay marriage in clip six. The intimate and committed relationships of same-sex couples, just like those of heterosexual couples, provide mutual support and are the foundation of family life in our society. Yet the legal commitment, responsibility, and protection that is marriage is off-limits to gay people as a class. The stain of unworthiness that follows on individuals and families contravenes the basic constitutional commitment to equal dignity. 
Well, Chief Justice Roberts doesn't believe that. Listen to clip seven. My question is, you're not seeking to join the institution. You're seeking to change what the institution is. The fundamental core of the institution is the opposite sex relationship, and you want to introduce into it a same-sex relationship. So as you see, the lines, the battle lines are drawn, and the world is burning, and the communists have nothing to do. In New York and other cities, they're rioting. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. You want to see how crazy this whole issue of gay, straight babies gets? You want to hear how crazy it is? Remember the earthquake in Nepal on Saturday? Ever since that earthquake on Saturday, Israeli government and medical planes have been evacuating surrogate-born babies. And they airlifted 26 newborn babies. And who are they? Gay men are going to Nepal for surrogates to, to have babies because surrogacy in Israel is limited to heterosexual couples Many gay and single parents hire surrogates in Nepal where the service is 50% less than what it would cost in America. And in the past, while India was the most popular place for Israelis to find surrogates, a new Indian law introduced in 2013 prevents, quote, gay men and couples who had been married for less than two years from engaging surrogate mothers. So as a result, Nepal has become the number one surrogacy destination for Israelis. And in some cases, Indian women are traveling to Nepal to birth babies for Israelis. And as a result, Indian women pregnant with Israeli babies are also trapped in the Nepal quake aftermath. Crazy, huh? How, how absurd can it get? How absurd can all of this get? I don't know where this ends. I, I don't understand half of what's going on in this whole situation. Why do homosexual men need to have surrogate babies? Why? In a world awash with... with, with uh, Orphans. What is this about but ego? Why don't you just adopt if you're a gay couple who wants to raise a child? They're not kids out there who need you? You're wonderful parents. You're kind. You're loving. You're autistic. You're sensitive. You're terrific. Why are you having babies through a surrogate, a third world surrogate? Why? Tell me why. I'm telling you the world is all about ego. It's all about ego comfort. There's nothing to do with decency in any of this. The whole thing's crazy. It's about me, 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 me. Put me ahead of everything else, including ahead of the children. It's not about the children. It's not about them wanting to have a child. It's about them wanting to show that they have a child. It's not about the child. Anyway, look, this is going to go around and around and around. And as Chief Justice John Roberts says, you're not seeking to join the institution of marriage. You are seeking to change what the institution is. The fundamental core of the institution, says Roberts, is the opposite sex relationship. And now you want to introduce it into a same sex relationship. So around and around the rhetoric goes. And all of us have different opinions on this. Hank, on KSFO in San Francisco, fire away, you're on the air. Yeah, hi, Mike. My point had to, uh, had to do with taxpayer-provided services. In the United States, we now have secular marriage. You can go to City Hall and get married. Right. Services provided for by taxpayers. So how can you not? How can you deny taxpayers if the city hall says we'll marry two people? We have the paperwork. You come in and do it. So if, how can you deny that to anyone who's a taxpayer in that community or you know um, that that's in that? In other words, taxpayer provided services should be provided to taxpayers who want them. Well, the chief justices are deciding it, not Michael Savage. And John Roberts is questioning this very issue by saying to the attorney arguing. I think from your point of view, is that you're not seeking to join the institution of marriage. You're seeking to change what the institution is. Yes, I understand, but I think we op they opened the door with the secularization of marriage. Now, the government provides marriage now. And, and a long time ago, that was not, not the case when our country first started. I don't, I don't believe that happened. However, uh, then you come into the issue of, um, you know, separation of church and state. And so you can have churches have the freedom if they want to marry heterosexual couples or homosexual couples, whatever their religious beliefs are, that can be dictated. And homosexual couples or heterosexual couples can get married in churches that accept them. But what about what will happen if it becomes the law of the land and a preacher says he doesn't want to do it? 
he'll face the same penalties as the bakery does or the pizza shop owner. He'll be fined by the government for not performing a gay marriage, won't he? Well, see, that's, that's where I think the Supreme Court needs to make this clear in terms of the options that are available to everyone. Under secularization, marriage is open to any two people that want to be married. And then on the separation of church and state, then churches have the option. There are churches now that will marry homosexual couples. I mean, homosexual couples have the option of getting married. And, and But you know about the bakery case, the Christian couple that didn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. They certainly would serve gay people, but because their religious beliefs, they didn't want to bake a cake. They would find $130,000. So the issue becomes, will preachers be forced to perform gay marriages against their religious beliefs if the Supremes decide that they should? Well, see, that's, that's where I'm drawing the line between separation of church and state. And I think the bakery issue is a separate issue. I'm just trying to focus on the definition of what we're talking about in terms of marriage. And as it is right now, we have secular marriages that are performed in City Hall. Yeah, but listen to what Scalia says in clip two. Fire it. We got a few seconds. But ministers who, who do not believe in, in same-sex marriage will still be authorized to conduct marriages on behalf of the state. You can't do that once it is a constitutional prescription. You see what he's saying, Hank? See? So it's not as clear-cut as any of us would like it to be. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. I'm sick of the white liberals who caused it. I'm sick of the thugs in the street who burnt it. You know, I feel like I'm getting a migraine from all of this. I'm in a talk business. I have to, like, incite you to talk. But I'm not going to just incite you. I don't want to incite you. Many of you are angry over what Obama's done. Uh, by laying the groundwork for those riots over the last six years. We know what he did. We know what Holder did. We know how they deballed the police. We know what's going on. Now, in the midst of all this, now we have to start talking about redefining marriage. Everything in our lives has to be torn to shreds by the radical left. It's how a revolution functions. Don't you get that? What they want to do is redefine not just marriage, but society itself. You don't understand this is more than marriage. It has much more to do with redefining the entire society. It's the same type of people who want to disarm the police, who want to disarm marriage. Do you understand what I just said to you? Well, that's my opinion. So let's go back to gay weddings. That's all anyone wants to talk about. That's what you want to talk about, nothing else. It's a good topic. We'll revisit it. So let us begin with the actual voices involved with Antonin Scalia, the man robbing toilet paper would not have known who he is. He would have think he was some Italian who ran Baltimore in the 50s. But no, Antonin Scalia is on the U.S. Supreme Court, and he's arguing with a woman named Bonato. It's Italian versus Italian. Antonin Scalia is the conservative. Ms. Bonato is the gay arguer, the arguer for the gay marriages. So Scalia asked Bonato the following. Let's hear clip one. Do you agree that uh, that that uh, ministers will not have to conduct same-sex marriages? If they do not want to, that is correct. I believe that is firm under the First Amendment. She believes. Notice she's a snake like all lawyers. I believe it's part of the First Amendment. Well, listen, Miss Bonato, if it's part of the First Amendment, then why are your cohorts harassing pizza shop owners and bakeries to make cakes for gays when they don't want to. Isn't that part of their First Amendment, Ms. Bonato? You're clean and nice in front of the Supreme Court now. You're wearing a nice press skirt, and you're a Miss Curtsy and Miss Miss This, yeah, First Amendment. You know you don't believe in the First Amendment. You believe in the Gay Amendment, which is do it our way or go to the highway. Don't tell us you believe in the First Amendment. Then Scalia goes on about clergy in clip two. Listen to this. But ministers who, who do not believe in, in same-sex marriage will still be authorized to conduct marriages on behalf of the state. You can't do that once it is a constitutional prescription. No answer to that. Right, of course. Once it's a constitutional prescription, then the ministers can't perform any marriage unless they perform gay marriages as well as straight marriages. I guess you can't say straight marriage anymore. That's sort of a slur. Uh, you have to use same sex. Op I never heard of it. It's like if I, if I, my, both my parents deceased a long time ago. If I said to them, you know that you, you were an opposite sex couple, they would have looked at me like, like I was crazy. Who ever heard of a redefinition of this in your lifetime? Your mother and father were an opposite sex couple. You hear this? They had to redefine themselves for less than 1% of the population. Oh, yeah, yeah. Your grandmother, your grandfather going back. 
a million years, they were they were opposite sex couples. Let's say five thousand years. So then Varelli, whoever he is, I guess he's another one arguing for uh, the other side. We, I mean, I have to be fair to the subject. Let's hear clip three now. The opportunity to marry is integral to human dignity. Excluding gay and lesbian couples from marriage demeans the dignity of these couples. It demeans their children, and it denies the, the, both the couples and their children the stabilizing structure that marriage affords. All of a sudden, marriage. I knew gay people. None of them ever wanted to be married. It's the furthest thing from their mind. The last thing the gay people I knew wanted was marriage. They entered that lifestyle to get away from the conventional life that their parents had because they, they couldn't stand it. It was stifling them. I know things were different then. I get it. It's different now. I get it. I understand that. It's a different time. Now suddenly marriage is the most important thing in the world to the gay community. Are you kidding me? Do you really think this is about marriage? We discussed it yesterday. If it's about property rights, visitation rights, that could be done very simply without redefining marriage for the entire universe. Domestic partnerships or by legal decree, period, end of story. It has nothing to do with marriage. It has to do with changing society at its core. The building block of any society is man and woman. I don't care if you're a Syrian. I don't care if you're a Libyan. I don't care if you're a lesbian. I don't care if you're a Staten Islander. The building block of any society is man and woman. Everybody knows that. Gays know that. They came from man and woman. So why do they have to change the structure of the world to reflect their own view of the world? Because they can. Because they control the media. That's why. Now we go on. I'm going to roll here. How many people hate me now? I don't know. I'm not trying to be hated. I am trying to have a discussion here. Let's have one more, which is from Mr. Roberts who was the man who gave us Obamacare, strangely. Nobody know, know why he, knows why he did that. He was the one who suddenly said it's a tax. It's not a tax. Therefore, it's Obamacare. Yes, you can have Castro care in America. So here's Justice Roberts now in clip four. Um, every definition that I looked up prior to about a dozen years ago defined marriage as a unity between a man and a woman as husband and wife. Uh, obviously, if you succeed, that core definition will no longer be operable. Then Alito asks, what will be the limits on same-sex marriages? Okay, clip five. It's a good one. Listen to this one. Suppose we rule in your favor in this case, and then after that, a group consisting of two men and two women apply for a marriage license. Would there be any ground for denying them the license? That's all. Polygamy is coming. Polygamy next. Marry a horse next. Want to marry a dog? Sure. Why not marry a dog? It's a nice furry creature, doesn't bother anybody. Isn't your dog entitled to marriage, too? Tell me why, if you change the name, uh, the definition of the word marriage, you, you cannot marry an animal. Tell me why. Explain that to me. How? How will it be limited? Isn't that a constitutional right to marry your cat or your dog? Now, I'm not comparing gays to cats and dogs. Please don't l lump the two together and make s something out of what I'm not saying. Don't try to do it. It's too late in my career. It's not going to work. You and George Soros and the rats who evade taxes and attack conservatives, you know what? You lost. You didn't win. So the fact of the matter is keep trying that you're not going to get me. I'm too smart for you, number one, and I'm not what you say I am, number two. And the best defense, by the way, for an attack is the truth. So don't try to lump me in with uh, the bigots because I'm the last thing on earth. The last thing on earth I am is a bigot. I am Michael Savage. I am a sexual libertarian. The nation is in, in, in a state of uh, emotional collapse. Everyone's against everyone else. So it's not bad enough the Islamo-fascists are hunting us. It's not bad enough that our intelligence agencies have been penetrated or weakened and are not doing their job. It's not bad enough that we're almost at the verge of war with Russia because of Obama and Hillary Clinton. It's not bad enough that Israel could be nuked if uh, John Kerry, the anti-American is permitted to sign the so-called nuclear deal. No, now we have to focus on redefining the most fundamental building block of a society, marriage. So let's talk about it. Since that's what the Supreme Court is doing, that's what we the people are going to be doing. Too. I don't think everything is what it appears to be, and I think there are other dimensions to reality. I always have known that my whole life. We all do. We seem to think that we're two-dimensional creatures, Sometimes maybe three-dimensional creatures, but sometimes I think we're multi-dimensional creatures. And I believe that there's more to, the, to any picture that meets the eye, including 
why Islam is on the rise, why the West is falling, and why America, in the midst of all of this, is obsessed with a situation such as gay marriage. I believe that there's a spiritual element to this entire picture that we can touch on if you want. How about the Baltimore riots? What would the spiritual element of that be? Why is that happening again? Why is it suddenly 1968? Why do we have minority mayors who tell the police to not, to not fight back against the rioters? And they only stopped the rioters, only stopped when the National Guard came out and had guns in their hands. Why are communists in New York City who have nothing to do, kids from the colleges who have nothing to do, usually kids from middle class houses, especially those radical girls running around with knapsacks all over, all over New York trying to burn things down? Attacking police, why? Why are they permitted to run rampant in the streets? Why? What's the spiritual meaning of all of this? Well, there's a lot of simple answer to it all, and then there's a complex answer to all, and then, of course, there's no answer to it. I'd rather talk about the no answer. We're supposed to believe we're living in progressive times. We're supposed to believe that we're living in times that are advanced. I would argue the opposite. My contemporary insights would tell me something else. And I, I tried to tell you this whole argument of gay marriage for one moment. Just remove the word gay and marriage from what I'm about to say and go back to my analogy of Jacob's Ladder because I want to do the mystical thing for one minute. What is Jacob's Ladder? Sulam Yaakov is a staircase to heaven that the biblical patriarch Jacob dreams about during his flight from his brother Esau. It is described in the book of Genesis. He dreamed. He lay, he lay his head on a rock, if you read Genesis, and he put the rock under his head, and he dreamed of a staircase to heaven. And he woke up, and there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, Christians believe Jesus is the staircase to heaven. Muslims believe in this concept of a staircase to heaven. Islam, in fact, in, in, in legitimate Islam, before the maniacs stole the religion, Jacob is revered in Islam as a prophet and patriarch. And legitimate Muslim scholars draw a parallel with Jacob's vision of the latter in Muhammad's event of Mirage. So what am I trying to say to you? Is that for one minute, change your view of everything. And understand, we just take the metaphor of Jacob's ladder, a staircase to heaven. And the mystics would argue, for example, that if you change the order of the rungs, you can destroy everything. If you pervert or confuse the rungs on Jacob's ladder, all of our troubles can be seen for what they are. I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. A plane bound for Amman, Jordan, goes down in the Caspian Sea. The crash yields no survivors except the hijacker. And a cask containing an agent of unprecedented destructive potential is missing from the plane wreckage. A carefully plotted terrorist attack has been put into motion, and the resulting chaos might be enough to push America toward another costly war. Countdown to Mecca. It's a gripping page turner. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All right, so let's finish up on this whole thing of um, uh, equality. That's what it's all about. On the issue of taxation... We need a uniformity and equality. And let me take it from the marital and exemption trust issue. I'll read it to you. It's one line. The unlimited marital deduction allows you to leave all or a portion of your total estate to your surviving spouse free of federal estate tax. Very important point. Gay or straight, nobody likes to be taxed by a criminal government that throws it in the garbage and abuses everybody by spending like crazy people. So if you're married and you die, you can leave all or a portion of your estate to your surviving spouse, and they pay no federal estate tax, right? So what does that do with gays? What does that mean? Well, the good news is, is that federal law allows the same situation if they marry in a state which permits same-sex marriage and does not permit 
when same-sex marry in states where the local vote has rejected same-sex. So what does that mean? It means that there are gays who are not having equality under the tax law. And this argument before the Supreme Court may come down to this one issue of standardized tax laws for all people. And as someone wrote, you cannot have one set of people gaining tax advantages over another. It is the United States, not the disunited States. The Civil War was a long time ago. So there is a valid argument for giving all people who are together this uh, marital exemption trust. Don't you think that's right? And if you can do it without redefining marriage is what I would like to see happen. I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can make that happen. In other words, if, you, if gays marry in a state which permits same-sex marriage, federal law permits this, no taxation of the transfer of a state on death, right? But federal law does not permit this exemption if same-sex people marry in states where the local vote has rejected same-sex. So there's a, a, what do you call it, a crazy quilt of laws, and yet there's an issue of taxation. And everyone's concerned about not being ripped off by a government, by the federal government, gay or straight. I don't know of any liberals who like to pay taxes. I mean, reported today that old Soros and Apple may have to pay after 10 years of uh, every trick in the book. Apple may have to pay Ireland 10 years of back taxes. You hear this? The European Commission has, has launched a probe into them for a long time. Apple, the great American liberal company, has paid as little as 2% on profits attributed to its subsidiaries in Ireland. You hear this? And George Soros, that lying sack of you-know-what, who always says the rich should pay more taxes, it turns out he's deferred income for many, many years. And it helped him build his fortune. They say it's a substantial part of Soros' wealth comes from delaying taxes. You hear this? At the end of 2013, Soros, through Soros Fund Management, had amassed $13.3 billion through the use of tax deferrals, according to Irish regulatory filings by Soros. Congress closed the loophole in 08 and ordered hedge fund managers who used it to pay the... Anyway, you get the picture. Just before Congress closed the loophole, Soros transferred assets to Ireland, a country seen by some at the time as a possible refuge from the law. So it shows that for the first time, the extent of Soros' almost $30 billion fortune came from finding ways to delay taxes and reinvesting the money he didn't pay in his own fund. Are you listening to all of this? So the biggest mouths for equality and fairness are usually tax dodgers and liars, in plain English. What else is new under the sun? Bill Clinton, Mr. Fairness, is hiding in Africa now as they investigate his, uh, you know, 10% is all they gave for all that money they raised. And Hillary's talking about fairness. She ought to start with the, with the Clinton Foundation if she wants fairness. So, you know, everybody says one thing, and uh, they don't always do the same thing they say. When it comes down to taxation, though, gay or straight, I think we should be uh, facing the same laws, not different laws, in plain English. And I wish we could do it without having to redefine the whole institution, upsetting religious people, and I think confusing the children. And I think that'll be my last line on this for quite a while until the Supremes decide. Tomorrow, it'll probably be Freddie Gray and the spike in the van and the head. 